Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Laura Riley. I'm the coordinator of Chicago Wilderness Alliance. We're going to give it a few more minutes while folks join us, but thank you for being here for the first cafe of 2024. Conservation for all. Didn't realize I had the distinction of being the first one for the year. That's exciting. It is. Seemed like so long off when we were planning it. <laughs> Jackie, I was excited to see McHenry County in there. Nice. <laughs> here I am. Nice to see you. <laughs> or hear you, I guess. I'm here. Well, we had a fairly large turnout, so let's just give it a, just another minute to see if folks join us. I'm going to ask you to keep yourselves on mute and your your uh, you can keep your cameras on or off, but we'll open this up. There'll be time for questions, and please feel free to put your, your questions or comments in the chat. I will help monitor those for Jackie, and... Um, you know, before we get started, I just want to give thanks to our sponsors. Uh, we're supported by the U.S. Forest Service and the Illinois Department of Natural Resources, Urban and Community Forestry. And equity work is important for tree health and for the work that they do. And we're just grateful that they were able to support our cafes and provide these opportunities for deeper learning around this topic. So I will drop some more information about how to learn more about their work and, and invite you all to consider becoming a Tree City USA city. Okay, and I will continue to let folks in, Jackie. Um, I want to introduce Jackie Barrow from McHenry County Conservation District. She is a, a restoration ecologist there, and she has been really helpful to our JEDI working group team as well, and appreciate her time today. Great. Does that mean we're ready to go? I think we are. Yes. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome. I am uh, Jackie Bureau, the stewardship ecologist for McHenry County Conservation District. And what that means is I actually work with our volunteers, uh, kind of half office, half in the field. And really, honestly, I believe my purpose in life is to help people. But my passion is conservation. So you'll see that kind of come up as we talk about different projects today. Um, since 2020, I have been involved with our diversity, equity, and inclusion initiative at the district and uh, excited to share more about that. But just to start off, I do wanna share the district's draft land acknowledgement statement. I want to note that this is not finalized. We're still incorporating some feedback from our reviewers and if you are interested in reviewing or know somebody who is interested in reviewing, contact Brennan Ness, who is kind of our lead person working on that. Um, we just want to recognize that McHenry County is grateful for uh, those folks who were caring for the land long before us and are still here today. That includes Ho-Chunk, Kickapoo, Mascouten, Miami, Ojibwe, Ottawa, Potawatomi, Peoria, Sauk, Meskwaki, Sioux Nation, and many more that we may not yet have listed. Um, we want to recognize that these are really special places and that they have a history with Indigenous people, but also that most importantly, we'd like to build relationships with our Indigenous communities that are here today and learn more about our connection to the land together. To give you some context about McHenry County, if you're not familiar, we're located in northeastern Illinois, just south of the Wisconsin border, west of Lake County. 
we are kind of along this urban to rural gradient. So the southeast part of the county is a bit more suburban. And then the further north and the west that you go, we get more rural areas. So you have a nice mix of um, all different types of folks um, from all different kind of backgrounds. Um, we manage um, almost 26,000 acres of land, but we're by no means the only land management organization or um, group involved in conservation in the county. There's a lot of other private and uh, publicly owned groups too. But we're here because we really want to make, um, you could insert your organization here, uh, a leader in providing conservation for all people. Uh, a conservation that's truly accessible, equitable, and inclusive of everyone that we serve. Um, part of this is that we want to make sure everyone uh, is able to be all hands on deck to take positive action. There's some bigger issues like climate change, habitat loss. Uh, um, you know, I don't have to read the, the list to uh, everybody, but there's those things that we need all hands on deck to tackle. I'm going to be using the term DEI a lot today. And I'm guessing if you're coming to this, you're already somewhat familiar with those terms, but just to get everybody on the same page for what I mean when I'm saying them today, diversity is the unique differences, differences that um, result in us treating being treated differently in society. So for example, I'm treated differently because I'm a woman, not because I have brown or blonde hair. And that includes a lot of different things. Race is one of them, but there's all these different types of things that we can identify with, uh, you know, gender, ability, um, even down to your different perspectives. Like a hunter might have a different perspective than a kayaker or equestrian. Um, inclusion is really the goal. We want to be not simply overcoming or tolerating those differences, but we want to be celebrating. Um, leveraging, valuing, welcoming our differences, and not just ignoring them. Equity is how we get there with your policies, your practices. And some of the terms you'll notice us using interchangeably today, um, these are all considered acceptable terms, excuse me, um, like um, Latino, Latina, Hispanic. Latinx is kind of a gender neutral term, um, but most self-identify as Latino, Latina, or Hispanic. We'll also say Native American or Indigenous people, um, but if you have a relationship with someone, they often prefer to be identified by their specific tribe's name. So we're organizations that serve the public through conservation. Service is literally written into our purpose, and so to be able to serve our community, we first have to understand them and get to know them. If we don't know who, in, who is in our community, how do we find that information out? And there's a couple of free resources that you can start with, like the US Census Bureau demographics. Um, for example, you'll see later we found the demographics for McHenry County online. You can do your own assessment or surveys and try to get some information and feedback from your community members that way. There's that Chicago Wilderness Cultural Survey that was done pretty recently. You can refer to as a reference. You probably have some kind of existing marketing data on your people who are participating with you, your volunteers, uh, people coming to your public programs, donors, that kind of thing. And if you are an organization that hires people, you probably have some kind of system that helps track your applicants. So both of those things that record data, it may be something as simple as, you know, turning on the option for people to self-report demographic data. They don't have to, but if they are choosing to, then you are able to look at that information. So the big question here is do we reflect our community? We'll do a little activity. I'm not actually gonna make you raise your hand, but kind of mentally raise your hand and think of a conservationist. So if 
the person you're thinking of matches any of those characteristics I'm about to list, kind of just note that. Um, so this person really knows plants or wildlife. They own Carhartt pants or a jacket. They give really great field guide re recommendations. They might drive a truck either for work or a personal vehicle. They often smell like bug spray. And does this person look like you? So part of the reason people are comfortable in our field is we're surrounded by people that are like us. And in the conservation world, we have to recognize that often that means white, able-bodied, heterosexual, or male. And that's not inherently good or bad. It's just a description. But we do have to be aware of the history of the field of conservation because it was created by and for these types of people. We're not gonna get into the really detailed history lesson. That's a topic for a different day or something to explore on your own after this. Um, but for today's purposes, we just wanna recognize that conservation as we know it was developed through the 1870s through the 1970s. And that time period, it was considered normal to discriminate and sometimes accepted and expected even. And so people who were in that world in that time, you know, they weren't gonna be different necessarily from the norms of that time either. So we need to be um, acknowledging that in what we do. And we do have a previous Chicago Wilderness Cafe called the History of Conservation for reference, if you would like to get more details on that one. That's about two hours getting into it. And so we just wanna be aware that um, people who were different from the majority as defined through this history were often historically excluded from conservation. But if that was so long ago, why does it even matter? Um, you know, we've come a long way since the 1900s even the 1970s, but sometimes we have these relics left over in our policies and our practices and our outreach efforts. If we say something, we're doing it because we've always done it this way, that should raise your eyebrow to ask further, you know, is there a solid reason or evidence why we do something? Is it really the best way to do it? Um, and is it disproportionately affecting some groups? We can have the best of intentions, and even if we're not actively trying to exclude someone, we still need to pay attention to those outcomes and adjust. Because if we were truly past this, we would expect people who are engaging with us, our staff, our volunteers, our program participants, would more or less match the community of the surrounding area. So what does our community look like? I think it's pretty common, especially in rural areas, to assume that there's not a lot of diversity in our community. But when we look at those statistics from the Census Bureau and this community snapshot data, almost a fifth of the county is not white. And admittedly, we don't have a lot of uh, ethnicity or race data for our participants. Um, so we're kind of speculating or making anecdotal observations. But part of the reason for that is we don't want to be meeting a quota. We really just want to make relationships, build relationships, make people feel welcome, and be part of our community. I think it is safe to say, though, like a lot of conservation organizations, we don't seem to have quite this level of diversity engaging with us or participating in the programs that we're setting up. And so people often ask, why aren't more, you know, insert your demographic here, people participating in conservation? So for example, why aren't more, I don't know, Hispanic people participating in conservation? You'll hear questions like that a lot. But I feel like this question is kind of loaded and it's full of assumptions because we're adding this unspoken hour to conservation. Why aren't people coming to our conservation? Are we only willing to offer it a particular way? You know, if we're talking about Latino outreach, you're kind of assuming when you ask that question that people don't already care about the environment or aren't participating. How do you know people aren't already hiking or fishing, having a picnic, 
enjoying the outdoors somehow, gardening. Are we really limiting conservation to this definition of like caring about the environment only if you're removing brush? And is that fair? I think instead we have to reframe this question to how can we co-create a better conservation? And before you just jump into developing something, you gotta spend some time on what's important, not just responding to you know what's popular or um, you know stepping into running events right away. We have to think about why and how we're doing this and gather some feedback. So I think our community members can really tell if you're doing a one-off event versus something that's more regular uh, in an attempt to provide inclusive, culturally relevant services. For example, we can say everyone's invited to a public tree planting event, but people in wheelchairs know that they may not be able to get to that area. Uh, we can say everyone's invited to public programs, but if they're always offered in English and the option for a translator isn't apparent, do they feel welcome? We can say everybody of all ages can come to restoration days, but maybe our pictures only have retirees in them. So we wanna really be introspective first when you're gonna start to define this initiative and you know, recognize the good and the things we can improve. I like to think of the analogy of, you know, if you look back at yourself in junior high, do you remember doing something that maybe you were embarrassed about or maybe you learned from? And you can look at yourself now and say, yeah, I would have handled that differently. But that's okay. We don't see that as a bad thing. That just means you've grown and you've learned. So, I feel like we can apply that to ourselves as an organization. We're learning and we're growing and we're figuring out what to do next. And that's okay. We're not gonna do everything perfectly, um, but we have to start somewhere and it's gonna take time. So at the conservation district, we started a grassroots DEI committee in June of 2020. And I led that committee for about two years. Uh, now I'm just participating as a regular person. Um, providing some insight and participating in other ways. Um, we acquired some funding to hire a DEI consultant. And in the meantime, while we were working on that funding, we reviewed, attended, and, you know, just looked at a bunch of resources on all these different uh, histories and demographic categories and just trying to learn. So then we put those into a format of ways that people can process the information. Maybe you're more of a podcast person. Maybe you like documentaries or books or short videos. And we also separated it by the length of time that you have. If you only have five minutes, here's something you can look at versus here's something that's like two hours that you can really dig into. When we hired our DEI consultant, we worked with um, Dr. Sean Bailey and define why DEI is important to us as an organization. We sought feedback through focus groups, a manager forum, and Q&A with our executive director. And we had an equity 101 training with all of our staff. And throughout all of this, the goal is really, you know, we wanna take a good workplace and make it even better and incorporate feedback the whole way through. And so when we look at ourselves, we have to ask ourselves a few questions. If you're gonna start outreach and new programs, why do you wanna reach out to this particular group? If your reason is, cause it looks good, or marketing told me to, that's not enough. Cause everyone should love conservation as much as I do. Although noble, that's not enough either. From the volunteer world that I work in, because we need more volunteers isn't enough. That's kind of extractive, especially if you're talking about underserved groups. But our purpose is really to serve people in our community through conservation. Next thing we need to ask is what are your assumptions about that group? Are they really not participating in conservation or maybe they don't know about us and our opportunities? Are we always advertising in the same places, for example? 
And have we asked them what they want or need? We could ask or do a, a survey that people can participate or maybe look at existing research studies, but we can't just ask our Hispanic friend to speak for all Latinos. That's not fair. And I don't think that would be very well received. Um, and if we're offering something that doesn't actually serve the group, we have to be honest with ourselves and say, why are we pushing this on them? Maybe we try something else. The other thing we can do is look for some partners. So these are really complicated topics to work through. And sometimes they need a buddy or two or three. And you work through it together and ask each other the hard questions. Uh, but something that you know we've found as a challenge is you can't always be of the community that you're trying to reach. We can be an ally, but who is already trusted in that community that you're trying to reach? And are they willing to partner with you and share some insights as to what their clients want and value? Is there anyone else too that and maybe another conservation organization. I can think of, you know, 250 plus in Chicago wilderness that might be interested um, in working on issues together with you. So working with your partners is a really great way to talk through those questions and ideas, help you come up with a better plan. You can share resources and build a network of people who wanna work on the same thing with you. And the goal is building relationships. Partners like this really help you expand what you're able to do. And especially if you're a smaller organization that you don't have the, the time, the funding, or the ability to do everything, we can share the load together. So the meat and bones of this is you know, examples that we've tried. Um, and I'm not an expert. We're not experts. But most likely, neither are you. So what is your circle of influence? Because DEI is something everybody can do and you can probably do more than you think. So as we go through these examples, know that DEI is not a one size fits all approach. What works for us might work for you, but it might not. You have to put in the work to get to know who is in your community. Keep going to trainings, especially on cultural competency. I don't know if you've ever met anyone who actually knows everything about everything. You might've met someone who thinks they know, but there's always more to learn. And especially you wanna know the history of groups that you wanna work with in your area. So you can avoid some of those major mistakes and get some perspective on why something might work here, but not there and build in ways to use feedback. Everybody that you engage with offers some valuable insights. And you know if you are collecting that feedback, you can use that to support and provide data for why we should continue to do this thing or why we should get funding for this thing. And if it's not working, it gives you an idea of why and how you can improve it for next time, or if maybe you should try something else. And know that you're probably going to fail sometimes, but it's really important to not be paralyzed by that fear. And in my opinion, it's worse to do nothing than to try and experiment and see what works. So with that, I'm going to jump into some of the examples. Laura, are there any questions we want to ask at the moment, or should I just keep rolling through? I think you can keep going through. We are, I don't see any questions in the chat. Okay. All right, jumping into the first example. How do you make a tree planting more accessible? So accessibility is one of the major interests of most of our staff. And a few years ago, we got a question from a person who used a wheelchair asking, can I even get to a tree planting event? So what we did was brought a three minute disability sensitivity training video to an all staff meeting. And then we broke into small groups to talk about what we could possibly offer. How could we make this work? Uh, it wasn't just related to wheelchair access, but you know, signage, interpreters, um, you know, is 
there that curb effect of if you provide flat, more flat uh, surfaces, are there other people who could use it? And so we took those notes and took it to the DEI committee to implement. We reached out to our local special recreation association and tried to ask, you know, what's some ideas we can run past? Or is this something that's actually of interest to the people that you work with? Um, we more so brainstormed with them and kind of ran ideas past them because the logistics were really daunting. We didn't even think of this as a possibility before. So it was really helpful to talk with them. We didn't co-host with them, but you know that's something we could definitely consider in the future and might be worthwhile. Um, some of the logistics we thought through were like, where would you even do this? Um, how? Uh, who needs to be involved? What do we have available already? And so we did pull it off <laughs> the first time we did it as a separate event. And, uh, you know, the goal wasn't really to have it as a separate event, like to say, hey, we got to have these people over here and everyone else over here. Uh, the goal is to just be able to incorporate it into an existing event. Um, that said, this was just kind of like an experiment to see if it was possible. So we did have several people come. Um, one person came in a wheelchair with a friend and we had some adaptive tools. We laid out this snowmobile matting that is about 500 pounds for a 50 foot roll and is super heavy, but we were able to use that to flatten the ground. We had to pick a spot next to an ADA accessible parking lot with a restroom and flatten out the entrance from the parking lot to the field where we went. Um, we had to recognize too, you know, everyone's in a wheelchair or needing flatter surfaces for a different reason. So we're not experts, but we can ask and learn. Uh, so the next time we tried it, we wanted to build it into our big tree planting event for the year, the October Big Woods planting. And we were able to do that and add an acorn planting section for folks who might uh, need different sensory or have different sensory needs. Um, we realized though the challenge with this was the snowmobile matting was super heavy and it's just not realistic to get it there every year. Um, that's a lot of staff time. You need a different machine to just hold it. Um, so we looked into and got funding for and purchased these panels called access tracks. They're temporary panels that you install and these places that are adjacent to an ADA accessible area, but you can put them on uh, grass or trails and get people out a little bit further. So with this, we hosted a couple of show and tell events. We set them up at different places, tried to gather feedback using our volunteers as a focus group and you know, ask questions. Uh, we, Throughout the process also found that we had a lot of existing resources, like we had stroller and wheelchair accessible facilities on our websites. We suggested maybe we make that easier to find on our website. And we also helped to update the accessibility page on our website. Uh, so before it was a little bit more like, here's how you file a complaint. And now it's more focused on, here's all of the options available to you and where you can find them. We noticed, uh, or we had an existing program with our education staff for the NISR group as well coming up and we asked them, hey, can we set these up and see how folks like using them? And so this is actually the NISR group that came. We set up the panels at an all staff meeting to introduce it to staff. And what we realized too, is it took a lot of time to set up. So. We created a volunteer certification to have some volunteers be trained on how to set them up to help. Because expecting someone, a staff member who's already leading a program to spend an additional hour or two setting this up is not realistic. So we we figured out all of the, the paperwork, so to speak, where are you gonna store it? How is it gonna be maintained? Who is tracking this training? Things like that. and. We did offer the access tracks at our most recent Big Woods tree planting. So we're still working out some of the kinks of how do we make more people comfortable with using it at a program 
And how would people be able to request that at a program? Knowing that you can't always use it at every every site. Um, switching topics actually, a little bit. Go ahead. Actually, a question from um, from Laura Dirks. How did you get the word out about more readily available information about accessible events and trails? Uh, we worked with our marketing team. Uh, you know, through their usual channels, they'll celebrate things like um, international. Um, uh, days for people with disabilities uh, and say, here's some of our accessible trails. So they have like regular postings and ways that they share that information. Um, you know, we've made suggestions for other ways that we could share it to, uh, you know, put it in our landscapes magazine or, you know, I am in charge of our volunteers for restoration days. So, you know, I can just send that group an email and say, hey, come check this out. Um, so. Are you able to do uh, to see this through your website tracking that many more are using the data? Um, I'm not sure. I would have to ask our marketing folks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or keep going? Keep going. All right, moving on to our next example. Uh, we worked on revamping our gender inclusion policy. And so... This started actually before the DEI committee existed. We had an LGBTQ plus staff member request updates to the transgender policy that was in our employee handbook. Something to note here is our HR manager is a permanent member of our DEI committee. And it's really important to have HR on board if you're gonna propose any policy changes. So they can be on your team as you're doing this. We started really by educating ourselves. Um, we revisited the issue a bit later, but we formed a subcommittee around this. And some of the folks on that committee did a presentation for us on gender identity, expression, orientation. If you've ever heard of the gender bred person, it's a really nice analogy for how to learn uh, all the different terms. And they looked at especially the uh, San Francisco policies as inspiration and as they were developing our gender support plan. And so it really broadened quite a bit um, to add a bunch of definitions, adding uh, information about pronouns, restrooms, dress codes, and how HR would support someone who might be going through a transition. And this actually went through relatively smoothly. So February 22, this policy was officially adopted into our annual updates for our employee handbook. So that was pretty exciting. We are interested in reaching out to more groups. Uh, you know, we have a pretty vibrant community, especially the Woodstock Pride event. Uh, we reached out to Out in Nature this year and invited uh, CJ Greco is a guest speaker. Uh, we are talking about perspectives on wilderness and asked if they could share a lens of uh, queer ecology. Uh, we co-hosted a seed collection day with them as well. And so this is relatively new. Uh, ideas and suggestions are welcome if anybody wants to collaborate. Uh, so we'll see where that goes in the next few years. Um, you saw earlier, you know, our, our biggest subgroup of uh, folks in the county are Hispanic folks, and it's really, they're growing dramatically compared to other demographic groups. We have uh, a lot of folks moving into the county or, you know, staying here. How do we stay relevant? So everybody is, you know, willing to participate in working on these generational problems. And I hate looking at graphs like this. I would much rather look at the faces. Um, think about this as 960 new people in the county every year that are Hispanic. You know, that's not an insignificant number of people. And that is our community who we serve. How do we get to know them and invite them to be part of this with us? So this brings up um, the Conversación de Conservación, a collaborative with several conservation organizations focused on Hispanic outreach. This includes uh, Environmental Defenders, Friends of Hackmatack, Land Conservancy, Hispanic Connections of Woodstock, and more recently, the Youth and Family Center of McHenry County. And 
They have done some outreach, but they also host some events. The district has a staff member who sits in on the meetings and we offer, you know, sometimes places to host events or collaborate on events. But usually if we're involved, we have to do it on our own sites um, for some of them. So they have done tables at community events like the Mexican Independence Day and Monarch Mania. They posted their own events like bilingual bus tour of some of our sites, self-guided tours. Again, many of those were on our sites for Latino Conservation Week. And they had a really successful uh, picnic this last couple of times. I think they had a live band and a taco truck. So they had like 70 plus people come, I think. They planted some pollinator gardens with the Youth and Family Center. <sighs> And with the Hispanic Access Foundation, they've hired um, that particular year, uh, Sunny Meva as a intern to help with Latino outreach. At the Conservation District, uh, a few years ago, I had been talking to Raquel Garcia Alvarez from Cook County. If you're familiar with her, she's been involved with some of the Chicago Wilderness Jedi efforts, very involved with Cook County's DEI efforts. Um, although I think they call it Ready, and is the founder of Environmentalists of Color. And something that she had tried and was pretty successful was doing Latinx restoration days. So after talking to her and seeing how that had worked, we decided we wanted to try this. But the challenge was we didn't have a lot of staff who either were Hispanic or could speak Spanish. So I kind of put a, a post out just, hey, it's Latino Conservation Rate Week. And one of our volunteers liked the post. So I messaged her and said, hey, do you know anybody who would be interested in helping to collaborate and create some Latinx restoration opportunities, um, especially near Woodstock or Crystal Lake? Um, and let her know this is part of a bigger DEI effort. This is not just like a one-off event. So I think in this situation, that's important to note you can't just assume someone wants to help just because they like to post. It's good to note the interest, but it is a lot of work to do this. So leave that opening. Don't assume that someone can or wants to be your translator just because they look Hispanic or have a Hispanic sounding name. It's not fair. And we also have to recognize our own shortcomings as an organization. So it lends a little bit of authenticity to what you're trying to do. At the time, we didn't have anyone available to help with this event who could speak Spanish, and we didn't necessarily know what would be a culturally relevant activity, but we were willing to do the research, have some conversations, and learn. So what that looked like for us is we, uh, you know, from our perspective, we've run a ton of restoration days. It's no problem for us to support that, but we can't be of the community. Kaina was a um, student studying conservation and looking for some professional development opportunities, also a local Latina from our community and was interested in helping. So we collaborated uh, via Google Doc, just kind of wrote out, hey, here's what we usually do for a restoration day, but what do you think would be beneficial to do or open to any ideas you have? And so we left it pretty open-ended and ended up coming up with something that was half Restoration Day and half Nature Walk. We included some Native American history, uh, knowing that uh, many Latinx folks have some indigenous roots. We talked about gardening quite a bit. And, you know, here's a plant that has a domestic variety that you might eat or put in your garden. Here's some beautiful flowers that attract butterflies that you can add to your garden, uh, migratory species that go to Central and South America. Uh, we talked about some nature-related sayings and children's songs, like if you scrape your knee as a kid, uh, your parent might say, sana sana colita de rana, to help you feel better, um, and introducing them to Latino conservation organizations, like environmentalists of color or Latino outdoors. Or even like Latino Sunidos clubs at local schools. And it's really important to make sure they're not being extractive. There's got to be something in it for your participants 
especially when working with an underserved group to ask them to do physical labor for free. Uh, it's not great. Um, so with advertising, we put everything together, listing the Spanish first. We sent the flyers to a bunch of different places. Uh, we did our usual marketing approaches, you know, social media, all that, and word of mouth from Kaina. We did end up changing the name at a certain point because we received some feedback that Latinx was still not a preferred term for most folks. It's a gender neutral term, but most are identifying as Latino, Latina, or Hispanic. And our first day was pretty successful. We had 10 participants, which when you consider most of our restoration days are maybe three to five volunteers, is pretty good. And we noticed a lot of the group was friends and family of Kaina, so that um, personal connection is really important. We had a lot of positive feedback and people had fun. I had a lot of people say afterwards they returned to the site to walk their dogs or picnic or whatever, and potentially would be interested in doing it again. So we tried to host about three of these per year, we experimented with different things like changing the location, changing the time of day, types of activity, seed collection seemed to be a little bit more popular than brush clearing. And then as opposed to me leading an event in English and then Kaina translating, we tried to switch that um, so that really she was the leader you know, we're promoting her and building her leadership skills and um, tried to leave, lead more of the event in Spanish as the norm versus doing so much in English. We tried to team up with different partners too. And we're very proud of Kaina and excited for her. She got a job and moved out of the area. So we've been kind of rebuilding and recruiting new co-hosts um, so we have been working with new volunteer, um, Sandra Baeno and our ecologist, Fernando Hernandez. Um, we had two opportunities with our new co-host this past year and the weather wasn't great. So we didn't have the best turnout, but we're still working out what we want to do this upcoming year. And, you know, if we want to experiment with anything else, different advertising, maybe um, working with schools or local churches. And some of the things that we had learned overall was that at least in our area, Sunday afternoons are better. Saturdays, people were often working and Sunday mornings, people were often at church. Uh, the personal connection was really important. Most of our participants came from word of mouth. Almost nobody came because of the flyers or the emails sent to volunteers. And we're still figuring out how we can do that better. It seemed to be better to stick with one location. I think that was related to having that personal connection. Um, the culturally relevant pieces are what people enjoyed the most. Again, you got to get something out of it uh, to come. And uh, we received some feedback that calling it a work day was kind of extractive. So we changed um, actually all of our work days to restoration days across the board. Given the interest in uh, Hispanic outreach, you can imagine we're also interested in language accessibility and offering more things in Spanish. Um, if you haven't already heard, Cook County recently released a language access policy that recommended providing translation for any languages that are used by more than 1% of your population. And so we took a look at our own uh, area and we don't necessarily have a policy on this, I think language accessibility policies are kind of a new thing still. Um, but we obviously have a lot of folks that speak Spanish, but we weren't really sure what these other categories meant. So like, what do you mean with Slavic languages or Indo-European languages um, as the other ones that have more than 1% in the county? So anecdotally, we've heard feedback that there's a need for Polish translation and American Sign Language to be offered. So there's challenges of you know figuring out what languages are needed next and funding. Uh, translation services can be expensive. So if we can get some of those things translated with the help of volunteers for Spanish and ASL, but is it fair to ask them to translate large government documents for free? So that's something we got to work on. And uh, we took a look at you know, what we already do. 
our marketing team had actually recently updated our website and it includes an auto translate button for over 130 languages. Often when I would go to our marketing folks with an idea or someone else would, they were kind of already in progress or working on something, which is awesome to see and really glad to have them working on this too. Uh, we have um, social media that can auto translate, enable closed captioning on webinars and adding alt text into our emails for, for screen readers. Uh, but we still have a need for in-person translation, especially in Spanish. Um, potentially future with Polish and ASL. Uh, and, you know, maybe in the future we can pull together a list of interpreters and educate our staff on how to request an interpreter. Um, we still have a lot of documents that are uploaded as PDFs to our website, so they can't be read or translated with, with a screen reader. Uh, so we looked into, um, we heard about these Parker, Parker Dewey micro internships that are currently funded, so we were able to get a free 10 to 40 hours worth of a project working with students. Uh, and we didn't realize till afterward, they were, the funding was for students from Connecticut and Florida, um, or you can pay for it uh, through their service to offer these. So we tested it out to um, provide some Spanish translation. And we did some educational handouts, signage, social media posts, and within a week, we were able to hire someone for that short-term project. We had plenty of qualified candidates. Their system was pretty easy to use and well-organized and great for remote work. And they have a connection where they share it with historically Black colleges and universities and Hispanic-serving institutions. Uh, the downside was it doesn't necessarily guarantee that you'll be able to hire the same person each time. For example, if you have a longer-term project where you're going to do it in chunks, um, and you don't, don't necessarily know how long this funding will last. But that said, it was a pretty good option. Uh, one thing that we're really excited about this year to provide is uh, Indigenous outreach opportunities. So you might have noticed on that previous slide that it was a pretty small percentage of McHenry County that identifies as American Indian or Alaskan Native. That was only 0.6%. And there's no federally recognized tribes in Illinois. So why focus on this? We're actually pretty close to one of the largest population centers of native people in the city of Chicago. Most of our native people here today live in urban areas. And I'm just gonna put a shout out to this Indian Country 101 training. Um, excellent one for a lot of background. The district, values both ecological and cultural history. So aside from we're near a big population center, this is just something that we value. We know that the landscape or plants and animals evolved with native peoples. And even since the district was created in the 70s, we've had archeological studies, written evidence, and we know that there has been indigenous presence on our sites historically. And we educate about that when we talk about our sites with people that come. But what is our responsibility as conservationists? Again, I'm not getting into the history. Definitely recommend that Indian Country 101 training. I think Chicago Wilderness might be working on an upcoming opportunity book club style. So stay tuned for whenever that becomes available. Uh, but the short version is we have to remember conservation wasn't exempt from the major views of its time. And that included the forcible removal of native peoples from the land. So we have to acknowledge that past. We can't go on ignoring it. We went back and forth on that land acknowledgement statement because depending on who you talk to, including within the native community, they're not always seen favorably. Usually the big issues are when people make a show about it and they don't actually follow through with the work to create meaningful relationships or an action plan. So on the other hand, many Indigenous folks see value in telling the story. This is making sure we know they're still here. We're not erasing their history and they're not a relic of the past. So that said, we're most interested in creating a better future together and building those meaningful meaningful relationships, which is where partnering with Trickster Cultural Center has come in. And it all started with a conversation. I actually went to 
a Morton Arboretum, uh, I think it was a storytelling hike and met Gina Roxas, who is now the executive director for Trickster. And she said, you know, we'll go wherever we're invited. And I said, we'd like to invite you. So following that, we had a nice conversation about what can we offer that's actually of interest to indigenous folks in our area. One of the unique things we have at the district is a uh, bison herd. Uh, it's one of the closest places to Chicago that people can view them. It's not publicly open for viewing. It's a privately owned herd, but we have had some events and volunteer opportunities where people get to see them. And we're interested in seeing how the land and the wildlife and the vegetation respond to them being there. So our agricultural ecologist, Brenna Ness, has worked with Gina and Trickster Cultural Center to set up a bison observation study. So there's a group from Trickster that has been coming once a season for this year. And I think uh, February, we have a research roundup event where um, that results of their observations are gonna be shared with us. We left it pretty open-ended. We wanted to get some information about what the observations were, but we also didn't wanna say, you have to conform to our Western science. We said, here's a form. It's kind of just, you know, here's the date and here's a spot to fill in a paragraph about what you saw. And then we'll take a look at that. Uh, we want to learn from indigenous science as well. Another thing we can offer is access to plant materials for medicines and foods. So it came up during our conversation that Trickster folks were driving all the way to Minnesota or Nebraska every month from Illinois to fulfill requests for indigenous families that wanted some kind of native plant material. We asked what they needed and a lot of the species they mentioned were overabundant and things that we would just remove during a brush clearing restoration day, like sandbar willow, willow bark, elderberries, golden rods, white cedar. And the amount they were talking about was not huge. Uh, it doesn't even make a dent. So there's no reason that we couldn't provide some cultural harvest days. Um, you know, there's some red tape around, um, you know, we have to protect species from poaching or overuse. Uh, and so we wanna be cognizant of that need from the land management organization perspective, but there's no reason we couldn't set up cultural harvest days. And so initially we started just inviting folks through Trickster, but we started inviting other indigenous serving organizations as well. If you think of other organizations that you would like to be invited, just shoot me an email after this. And so far this year, we've hosted three cultural harvest days. Oh, my screen froze, there we go. We can also act offer access to our natural areas uh, to participate in uh, traditional ceremonies. So in 2022, we had a winter solstice ceremony with the Trickster staff at our Lost Valley Visitor Center. We didn't have a lot of turnout because it was super cold and driving conditions were, uh, you know, typical winter. <laughs> Coming from a long ways, it was a hard uh, time to get there but it was a really nice way to set intention for our partnership moving forward and see what we wanted to do for the upcoming year. So in 2023, uh, just this December, we hosted a public program called Welcome Winter Solstice with our Trickster partners. And this is actually a, a multicultural uh, celebration. So there's several tribes represented in the folks in that picture there. And they shared traditional singing, dancing, drumming, and storytelling. Uh, the people leading invited us to be part of a community dance and shared how you respectfully participate. We had craft stations, um, places where people could check out books by Native authors, um, and you could buy to support Native artists, jewelry, or other artwork. So that was a really cool, well-attended event. We sold out and had 50 people come to that one. So we're hopefully going to be able to do that again in the future. Something else we can offer is, especially if an idea is too big for us to handle alone, 
networking. We don't realize that as an ally, this is one of the biggest things that you can offer is who else is working on similar issues. And so one idea that was brought up was a native led climate summit. And, you know, they said, we have an interest in this and helping our climate refugees, human and non-human. So how do we do that? Uh, you know, they said they didn't have the resources to set up the big event, but would love to be part of the planning. So we literally just introduced them to uh, the Chicago Wilderness Group. And that's being worked on uh, probably a couple years to get that going, but, you know, we can make the introductions. The other question that we had is how do we share Indigenous perspectives with our folks, our staff, our volunteers, our public, and we co-hosted with our Trickster staff, again, uh, with singing and dancing and drumming, the Weekend of Restoration event. This was a full weekend event. Uh, Gina Roxas stayed with us for the whole event and shared um, a couple of different storytelling times, as well as throughout our normal activities like tree planting and doing an acorn research study, just some indigenous perspectives about what we were doing. And that was great. We got to share some learning there. We've hosted a couple of storytelling events, um, especially since I've been involved with this uh, for our volunteers. So we had two sessions of that and our staff actually requested one for them because they wanted to come and couldn't always make the dates. So we're doing a session for all staff in February of this upcoming year. You saw our land acknowledgement at the beginning. And so that is actually something that has been in progress for probably about two years. We did a bunch of our own research as a starting point. And then we've also reached out to probably over 20 different tribal historic preservation officers. We have heard back, I think, from six groups. And um, Trickster also agreed to review our land acknowledgement statement. It's a work in progress, and we're still incorporating some perspectives. But we, in this process of incorporating feedback, wanted to talk to our staff about it. So they co-hosted a session with us to do a workshop about land acknowledgement statements with our staff this December. Another one recently, we uh, reviewed some content. Our education staff met with Trickster staff to talk about our Festival of the Sugar Maples. We share a couple of Native American stories, and those things were well researched beforehand, but it's always a good idea to make sure things are accurate and culturally sensitive. You can't talk about what we can offer without talking about paying people for their time and expertise. And in particular, all of the projects we've talked about so far, that's asking for a lot of input. We're creating programs, documents, and really working hard to build relationships with community members we haven't previously reached. So we have to pay people. This is especially for something like a land acknowledgement or doing a storytelling program equivalent of paying someone for a technical review. You wouldn't do a wetland mitigation project without getting a technical review from an engineer. So we're thinking of it that way and that people deserve to be paid for their time. Interestingly, we ran into some bumps trying to pay folks for reviewing land acknowledgement statements. It's not quite as easy as it sounds because not all Native people agree on whether or not you should do a land acknowledgement statement. So some wouldn't accept payment due to politics around those statements and instead said, hey, can you donate to this charity that supports Indigenous youth or something like that? There's a ton of other examples that I could highlight, but really, I want to highlight that DEI is something everybody can do. I'm going to mention very briefly a few other projects that staff have come up with on their own. And they're doing a great job of keeping DEI present and seeing how they can do it in their circle of influence. For example, our education staff, uh, in addition to doing many events with NISRA, um, they figured out funding and getting a wheelchair for our visitor center. So if people are in our handicapped spaces, they can call and say, can you come pick me up with the wheelchair? I'd like to come into the visitor center. 
our marketing staff did a Find Your Wild challenge that had over 1,500 participants. And what you may not know about that, even if you've heard of it, is that you could achieve all levels of the prizes by only going to ADA accessible areas. That is so awesome. <laughs> um, really, anytime we've mentioned something in the marketing, they're already doing it or they're looking into it already. Um, so I really appreciate that. We've had some managers look into and express interest in 360 degree performance reviews when people do their annual evaluations for the year. Our HR manager was looking into an updated applicant tracking system that removes bias or has features to reduce bias, like removing names. So you're only looking at the skills of people applying. We had a women's chainsaw training event. Our planning department had an ADA audit and our continually making updates and incorporating universal design into their new builds. We had some signage for a big woods plant planting translated to Spanish this year. Um, anytime you talk to our rangers, they're seeing the public very, very often, and they always have lots of great ideas. So this is an endless list. It, this could keep going on and evolving. You know, we can just keep learning. So to recap, um, remember to include a bigger DEI effort, not just do a one-off event and spend that time on what's really important, including reflecting on what your own assumptions might be. Everybody has assumptions about everything. It's just important to take a step back and think about them. Incorporate from the beginning a structure so you can seek feedback and respond to it in a respectful way, of course. And don't focus on trying to meet a quota. I feel like that seems obvious, but uh, your focus should really be on building meaningful relationships and making people feel welcome. Something we learned with the marketing of this, which, you know, caveat, I'm not a marketing person. Uh, when we are advertising for things and we don't show pictures that if somebody looks at it and they say, nobody looks like me, they might not be comfortable coming. So something that you can do to help with that is take pictures at all of your events. Your marketing team probably wants them anyways, but I bet you have diversity in your group of age, gender, you know, perspectives. There's a lot of other things besides just race to consider. Don't make somebody who does show up from that group you're trying to reach the poster child for diversity. And don't reuse that picture over and over and over and over again. That doesn't look good either. If you don't have a lot of content yet, you can share posts from partners who are celebrating diversity, you know, like Black Birders Week, um, Latino Outdoors. Uh, there's lots of things out there um, that, you know, you can find endless lists of these things. And you can tell some of those stories that haven't been told in conservation and incorporate that into your programming. Maybe you have a site with some history. Uh, maybe you just go with, as a starter, you know, that book on Harriet Tubman being an unsung naturalist. There's plenty of resources out there if you do some research. There's not really a, a right number of times to do things, but you do need to make an effort to do regular events that build trust. You know, as a small agency, especially, it can be hard to um, find the budget or to hire somebody or to set up a wheelchair accessible event every single time. We know that might not be realistic, but the feedback that we've heard is people in the community want to see a regular effort to include them. Not something that they have to request, but it's just built into the program already. And you know, a lot of our decisions on how many times to do this were honestly based on what was feasible. You know, we had three Latinx restoration days and that was partially my time for how many weekends I could accommodate in addition to other projects and priorities. We had one tree planting event that was wheelchair accessible out of eight tree planting events in one year. And we chose to make that the bigger public one. So there are many other options for things that you could do. And of course, we talked about a lot of partnerships throughout this. So it's not a one size fits all. You're gonna have to experiment and you know work with people in your community who wanna work on it with you. So 
With that, I do want to thank our DEI committee. There's uh, seven to eight of us on at any particular time. Uh, also, Brenna Ness, Pete Jackson, and Kaina Gonzalez helped in preparing this presentation. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, Jackie. That was really, really informative. There have been some questions, and I want to go back to where we were talking about accessibility of language. And um, some folks had some really good questions about how um, how the um, what type of document can be read by a screen reader. Do you know that answer? Um, I know a lot of uh, that is probably online. You could probably Google uh, pretty easily what is readable. I don't think the, you know, if you have a PDF, some of them, it will allow you to select and edit the text. I would think that those are able to be read by a screen reader, but the ones especially that are, you know, older scans, it doesn't pick up editable text on that would not be. Um, so I would Google it. I don't know the exact answer, but that's my best guess. That's good. Do you know how accurate the Google Translate or the translator is on your screen reader? Um, I haven't combined screen readers and Google Translate, for example. Um, individually, if you're trying to throw something into Google Translate, sometimes it gets the names or the verbs incorrect. Um, so you always want to have a real person double check it. It can be a starting place. Or for example, when I put out that post, about Latino Conservation Week, just trying to see if anybody was interested. I only did a couple of words that I was pretty sure were accurate. Um, some of your social media posts may automatically translate for you. So something to look into. But if you have somebody uh, that can help translate or double check, that's the best solution. OK. Um, there's a message here from, from Sarah at Bluestem Ecological Services. She said, we've seen a growing interest in foraging. While I recognize that foraging on district property is not allowed, I'd love to connect with someone for edible plant ID walks that knows some of the common names of plants that grow from Central America through our region. For example, rose mallow, hibiscus, uh, latus is Jamaica, ha, ha, Jamaica, ha, Jamaica in Mexico and used to make tea. Mm -hmm. Um, that might be a really interesting connection to ask folks maybe at the Morton Arboretum or your local, um, the, the U of I Master Naturalists or Master Gardeners programs. Um, we do walk that line of if we run an event where we show people where foraging is an option, we show people a plant that opens up the possibility of people coming to collect and overuse that particular spot. So we're trying to balance the need of being protective of those species while you know, there is an interest in that. Um, but it's usually not the person that comes to your class that's the issue. It's they post a picture, it gets shared on social media, somebody else sees it, and then a billion people come to that same spot and do it. We see the same thing with Birds, for example, bird sightings in particular locations are shared. They can be disturbed by the amount of people that come to see them. So that's something to be cognizant of if you try to set up any kind of foraging. But I would bet that there are probably programs out there that maybe manage gardens and you could talk to them about collaborating. Thank you. Um, if anyone else has a question, um, feel free to unmute and and ask Jackie. Uh, we can stick around for a few more minutes. Otherwise, if you need to go, I think this is the end of our formal presentation, correct? I'm going to stop the recording now. But